Well, church family, if you would take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 21. Uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 21, uh, where we continue our storyline through the life of David, as Travis mentioned, the whole church and the whole word for a whole year. Uh, And I'm excited to unpack this text with you today. Uh, And so, you know, a couple of years ago, I completed an advanced degree in leadership. And believe it or not, we spent one entire afternoon talking about a simple fable. You might have heard it before, you might have not, but the fable goes like this. had a chicken and a pig who were walking down the road together. And the chicken, at some point, turns to the pig and says, hey, I think we should open a restaurant. The pig thinks about it and says, well, what would we call this restaurant? The chicken thinks about it and says, let's call it bacon and eggs. The pig thinks it over for a second says, "Mm, I don't think that's a good idea. Chicken says, why not? Pig says, because you would be involved, chicken, but me, I'd have to be fully committed. (laughs) Think about it for a second. And so we use that in leadership circles, that simple little faith, to talk about this reality. There are a lot of people who would say, I'm committed to my cause, I'm committed to my church. I'm committed to my purpose. But the reality is most people just want to be involved. They don't want the level of sacrifice required of the pig to open a restaurant with the name Bacon in it. But here's the thing that I pray that you're learning this year as we go through the whole storyline of Scripture. That we serve a God who is fully committed. He is fully committed to his purpose and his plan. He is fully committed to bringing about his glory. He is fully committed to working to sanctify the hearts and lives of his people for his great name's sake. You're going to see all those threads and more in this one seemingly random story from the life of David out of 1 Chronicles chapter 21. Would you stand with me in honor of God's word as we read this passage today? We're going to begin in verses 1 through 8 and work our way through this chapter. Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to count the people of Israel. So David said to Joab and the commanders of the troops, Go and count Israel from Beersheba to Dan and bring a report to me so that I can know their number. Joab replied, May the Lord multiply the number of his people a hundred times over. My Lord the king, aren't they all my Lord's servants? Why does my Lord want to do this? Why should he bring guilt on Israel? Yet the king's order prevailed over Joab. So Joab left and traveled throughout Israel and then returned to Jerusalem. Joab gave the total troop registration to David. In all Israel, there were 1,100,000 armed men, and in Judah itself, 470,000 armed men. But he did not include Levi and Benjamin in the count, because the king's command was detestable to him. This command was also evil in God's sight, so he afflicted Israel. David said to God, I have sinned greatly because I have done this thing. Now please... Take away your servant's guilt, for I've been very foolish. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Pray with me this morning. Lord Jesus, as with every verse and every chapter and every page of Scripture, would you help us to understand today the gravity of our sin, our need for a Savior, and the greatness of of your plan that you are fully committed to accomplishing. Open our ears, our hearts, and our lives to you in this place today, Lord Jesus. And it's in your name we pray these things. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. You may be seated. So we continue in the storyline of God's word, God's covenant people. We're in the scene five of the Old Testament story, kings and kingdoms, as we see God continuing to shape a kingdom people and to point to his future Messiah. 
Now, this week we had our preaching team retreat. This is when our nine campus pastors, our deaf pastor, our, uh, uh, our, Hisp- our uh, uh, Chinese pastor, we get away uh, and we spend time planning and praying into what we're going to preach in 2025. Uh, so you can join us in that journey as we've already started to think about next year and the direction the Lord would want us to go across our campuses. But we, of course, were talking about this week's sermon. And several of the guys said, I'm going to get to say something I've never said in five or 10 or 25 years of ministry. Open your Bibles today to 1 Chronicles. We don't hear a lot of sermons out of 1 Chronicles. And that's because, of course, the Chronicles are, are a retelling of First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings. All of those, just one book originally, but divided because of the size of scrolls. That's why there's a, a first and a second. But if you look and pay attention carefully, it's more than just deja vu. I know during your Bible reading, if you listen like I do as well to to the Bible in our Bible reading plan, you feel like you're hearing the same stories over and over. But if you look and listen carefully, there's some important nuances. For example, this story today is also found in 2 Samuel chapter 24. And so there's a reason for those nuances. There's a reason the Holy Spirit inspired it to be kept. You see, the book of Chronicles was a retelling of Samuel and Kings that was put together probably by Ezra the priest after God's people returned from exile. Now, we're not to that part of the story yet. We'll get there in a few weeks. But God's people returned to Jerusalem. They returned to the promised land. And the Chronicles are pulled together to make a point so that God's people who were beaten and broken down would have hope in God's plan for the future. We have sang this morning about God's faithfulness. And it was designed to point to how God had been faithful through the reign and rule of the kings of Israel in order to point forward to a day that was to still come. And that the coming day had two important elements. One was that someday God would send a Messiah who would be like the good attributes of David, but even greater. The second piece was to point to the future glory of the temple where God's people would gather together for worship. And so the author of Chronicles is highlighting those two things, and you're going to see them come together in today's story. So what's interesting is it edits out usually most of the the, the negative stories about David. Not because those stories didn't happen or because they weren't true, but because the author of Chronicles wanted people to put their hope in what was to come into the Messiah. So it highlights the positive stories in order to grow their hunger for God's Savior to come. As we're spending all this time in the Old Testament, I hope that hunger is growing in you. We see these, quote, Old Testament heroes, but we also see how flawed they are. And so that should grow our hunger for the coming of the Messiah. And believe me, by the time we get to the Gospels in the last quarter of the year, you're going to be ready for it, and so am I. But that's by purpose. Just like the author of Chronicles wanted us to have a hunger, a hunger for what God was going to do in the future. And so it's interesting that this story is included about David, because Chronicles doesn't have very many, quote, negative stories about David. That should tell us something. It wants to show us what God wants to reveal. And the first thing that we see revealed is that God is fully committed to exposing our pride. God is fully committed in his plan for the good of his people to expose our sin. It's something that God is actively working to do to show us that when we try to do things in our own way, in our own strength, that we fall short. How does the story begin? Well, right away, we're met with David counting the people. And we say to ourselves in our modern context, well, in our country, we count people every 10 years. That's a perfectly acceptable thing for a a king and a kingdom to do. You need to know how many people you have. You need to count your army. You need to know how many are in that standing army, how many soldiers you have. That seems perfectly normal to us. In some of our communities in Middle Tennessee, I've lived in Spring Hill for the past 23 years, just moved up this way a little closer to the church, but we've taken a census every few years because our communities are growing so fast, we've got to know how many firefighters do we need, how many roads do we need, how many public services do we need. We have to know these things. So at first, this just seems to make sense to us. But all of a sudden, David's commander of his armies, Joab, is pushing back. He finds what David wants to do detestable. As a matter of fact, he uses an important word. He says, why does my Lord want to do this? The word in Hebrew is seek. Why why does my Lord seek to do this? 
It's the same word that David uses just a few chapters earlier in 1 Chronicles 16. And this is a big clue for us. In 1 Chronicles 16, 10 and 11, David himself writes, Honor God's holy name. Let, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord in His strength. Seek His, seek his face always. And what Joab is doing by using that same word is to say, hey David, just a minute ago you told us to seek the Lord, but now you're seeking numbers. What's up with that? Well, remember the whole theme of the David narrative is found in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, where it says, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at what? The heart. And so in this situation, it's not David being a wise and good king to count his people and his army. This is about David's pride. This is about David saying, you know what? The Lord told me in chapter 17 that he is the one. He's the one who will defeat my enemies. David's saying, but you know what, Lord? I don't need you. I can do it. You know why? I have 1.1 million men in my army. And so what God's doing is he's exposing David's heart. Instead of counting on God's faithfulness, David is counting on his own resources as king. Instead of numbering God's promises, David is numbering his troops. And the same is true for you and me. We have these manifestations of our pride that come in, in various sources and in various forms. Instead of standing on God's faithfulness, we rely on what we can do in our own strength. And God will expose that every time. It betrays David's lack of faith. God isn't against taking a census. We'll see that in just a few moments. But he's against when we try to depend on someone or something other than him. Because he knows that something or someone will ultimately let us down. He wants us to trust him. He wants us to rely on him and his wisdom and his strength. God sees a big picture that we cannot possibly understand or fathom. So there are times in scripture when a command comes and God says, trust me, trust me. We live in an era in which we mistakenly think God is just a slightly stronger, slightly wiser version of us. So we want the command to make sense to us. God never, never, has to give a reason. Sometimes he does, sometimes he doesn't. Let me give you an illustration that might be helpful. Any parents out there, any grandparents? All right? Sometimes we will instruct our kids, especially when they are young, about things of which they do not fully understand. My son's little, he's curious. He holds a little shiny metal object called a fork. Guess what forks fit perfectly in? Those little slits in the wall that we call wall sockets or electrical outlets, All right? Son, don't when he's two years old. Like, don't do that. That's our response. Now, I could go the route of saying, well, son, let me explain this to you as a toddler. You see, there's these tiny little electrons, subatomic level kind of stuff, and they jump back and forth, and that creates something that we call an alternating current. And we've discovered that that alternating current is helpful for powering things like refrigerators and vacuum cleaners, so we run it through the wires in our wall. But if you stick that metal object into that alternating current, that alternating current now goes through your body. And your little body, it may burn your skin, it may stop your heart, right? It, it may mess with your central nervous system. How do you think that would go with a two-year-old? Right over their head. And because God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. God is up to something way above our pay grade. Often when it comes to his commands and his purposes, he says, trust me. Now, some of you in this room don't like to hear that because we want it to make sense to us. But God says, I promise, I love you. I have your best interests in heart. Trust me, simply obey my word. And in this moment, God finds David's senses evil because God can see David's heart. And he can see what's growing in him is this sense of pride. And this is another thing we may not like, but it is a form of God's mercy and his grace. He will expose whatever in our life is hindering us from becoming more like him. And that's what God is doing in this moment in David's life. It happens to be, for him, counting his people, counting his army, the number of armed forces that he has. For you, 
It may be another form of counting. We live in an era because of technology in which we're tempted to count and justify things based on numbers like never before. I was told at a conference a couple of years ago that as a pastor, if I didn't have 10,000 followers on Instagram, I'm not an effective minister. Go to Jay Strother online on Instagram, you'll see I have about 700. So if you could go there and follow me, (laughs) I would feel real much better about myself and my ministry, right? What's the implication? You are how many people you influence. Maybe the number, if you're an athlete, of of points that you score in the game, your batting average, I used to be a baseball player, right? Your statistics, maybe for you it's the number of zeros in your bank account. Maybe for you it's the the number of likes or comments that you, you get on your social media posts. Whatever it is, we all have our temptations. Let me be honest and transparent. You know who's the worst? Pastors. I meet and connect with them all the time. So the pastor's conference out in Colorado with my wife just a couple of weeks ago. You're waiting around, talking, getting to know guys, and then you know the question's coming. How many does your church run? I tell you, I've been in ministry since I was 19 years old. The quality of ministry is not about the crowd, it's about your faithfulness. But yet, we tend to do those things. We measure our effectiveness. We call them the three B's, Right? How big is your building? How big is your budgets? And how many, I don't want to be crass, right? But how many bottoms fill your seats? Anybody grew up in a church in which you had the little wooden board behind the platform? Had the number of attendants, the number of people coming to Sunday school. I see some of you nodding your head. You know, the the number of uh, amount of money that was given to the church. They used to call those brag boards. (laughs) That's how people would brag, right? Know how many people were coming, those kind of things. We all have a temptation to be identified, to be labeled, right? To find our security and worth in something other than the Lord. And so what God is revealing in David's heart is the fact that David was trusting in the strength of his armies instead of in him in this moment. And God was willing to break David of it. And we might look at it and be like, really God, you couldn't let David off the hook for all the other great things he had done? Well, David agrees with God's assessment. Look at verse eight. I have sinned, David confesses. He's not afraid to call it out. That's the first problem for many of us. We're not willing to admit it. Pride, pride is stubborn. C.S. Lewis calls pride the great sin, the devil's most effective and destructive tool. The theologian John Stott says, pride is your greatest enemy, but humility is your greatest friend. And in this moment, David recognizes that he's been prideful. I have sinned greatly because I have done this thing. Now please, please take away your servant's guilt, for I've been very foolish. David admits that he has been foolish in this moment. And so he repents, and we have a God who forgives. And yet, a God who loves us enough that we have to endure the consequences so that we'll learn. And so that leads us to our second point this morning. God's not only fully committed to exposing our pride, our sin, but he is always fully committed to keeping his word. And so if we go on in the story, verse nine, the God, had, God instructs Gad, that's a prophet, like Nathan, David's seer, go and say to David, this is what the Lord says, I'm offering you three choices. Choose one of them for yourself and I will do it to you. World's worst game show. Door number one, door number two, door number three. David, I want you to feel the weight as a leader of what you've done. I want you to choose the consequence. And this is what sin does to us. It limits our options. Oh, we still have options, but none of them are as good as if we would have obeyed in the first place. And so Gad went to David and said, these are your choices. Take your choice. Three years of famine or three months of devastation by your foes with the sword of your enemy overtaking you or three days of the sword of the Lord, a plague on the land. The angel of the Lord bringing destruction to the whole territory of Israel. Now decide what answer I should take back to the one who sent me. Verse 13. David answered Gad, I'm in anguish. Please, let let me just fall into the Lord's hands because his mercies are very great, but don't let me fall into human hands. 
So David, he's paralyzed. He doesn't know what, what choice to make. So he simply says, I, Lord, I'm just going to appeal to your mercy. I'm just going to fall on your mercy. And the next verse says, so the Lord sent a plague on Israel. And 70,000 died. What was this all about? David and his numbers. Now an army that had taken David 30 years of his career to build is decimated in three days. Because David was disobedient. Now there's an interesting connect that I hadn't made before this week. I told you there's always, always a gift for the preacher. It's that I realized why God chose plague. Because he was fulfilling his word. Look with me in your Bibles at Exodus chapter 30. Way back in the law of Moses, God had told the people how to take a census. And here's what it says in verse 11. The Lord spoke to Moses. When you take a census of the Israelites to register them, each of the men must pay a ransom, a price for his life, to the Lord as they are registered. Then no plague will come upon them. Hmm. So what you're telling me is David decided to do God's things David's way. That's the problem. We want to do things our way. Well, God, that's unreasonable. I I need to count my army. I'm not going to charge the people for that. What was the point? Look with me at verse 16 of chapter 30. Take the atonement price from the Israelites and use it for the service in the tent of meeting, the tabernacle. It will serve as a reminder for the Israelites before the Lord to atone for your lives. Man, that's some theological words in there. What's the point? The point is this. God ordained a census to be taken, and even even when an administrative task like a census was to be taken, it was to be an act of worship. Do you understand that, brothers and sisters? Everything that we are to do is to be an act of worship. And so in this moment, they bring a little bit of money. It wasn't really about the money, but it was about being reminded that God had redeemed them, that God had purchased them from slavery in Israel. So now this was another chance, as they are counted, to be reminded how God had blessed them, how God had multiplied them. And oh, by the way, that ministry, that money that's collected, it's going to be used for the ministry of the tabernacle, which was there for what? For the people. It was going to come back to them. Do you see how good God is and how he connects all the dots? But David had short-circuited all of that, had ignored God's command. And so God says, fine, David, have it your way. I'm going to keep my word. I always do. And a plague comes over Israel. What's interesting is God's compassion is shown even in this. Because it says a few verses later, as the angel is going afflicting the plague, that God relented. That doesn't mean that God changed his mind. God doesn't do that. It doesn't mean that God make a mistake. He didn't do that either. Instead, what it means is God said, enough. And God stops the plague even before David prays his next prayer. You see, that's compassion. That's when sometimes God says, fine, have it your way. And he lifts his hand and he allows the natural consequences to take place in our lives and in our world a lot of what we're enduring as a culture right now. God's saying, fine, have it your way. And he relents just a little bit of that judgment we experience, a little bit of that brokenness. If God removed his hand completely, we would all be doomed. But God in his mercy and his compassion and his grace says, that's enough for now. And that's exactly what took place in this story. David cries out a prayer to God. Look with me. In verse 17, David said to God, wasn't I the one who gave the order to count the people? I am the one who sinned and acted very wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? Lord, my God, please let your hand be against me and against my father's family, but don't let the plague be against your people. David, again, recovering his senses, tries to be a good shepherd who's willing to lay down his life for his sheep. But here's the problem. David's a sinner just like his people. Even if David sacrificed himself, he could not be the perfect spotless lamb. And this leads us to the third point in the story today. God is fully committed to fulfilling his plan. And oh, church family, this this is where things get interesting to me. At the end of this chapter, God says, all right, David, now that this is done, you need to make a sacrifice. God's way of providing a way for us to reconcile with him. 
And so the city of David in Jerusalem, David had conquered the city called Jebus, right, where the Jebusites lived. And so he had set it up as his capital. You can go there to this day. I've been there. Some of you have to see the the excavations of the city of David on a certain point in a mountain in Jerusalem. But just above that, there was a threshing floor owned by a Jebusite named Ornan. And I know this seems really random right now, so hang with me. But God says, I need you to go to that threshing floor. And that's the place that you're going to offer your sacrifice. And so David shows up. It's almost humorous in the story. You go back and read it. And and the angel of destruction is over his shoulder. And Ornan's eyes get big and his sons run and hide. And Ornan falls face down and says, because of that angel, right, whatever you want, it's yours. And David says, no, I'm going to buy this threshing floor from you. And Ornan's like, no, 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 It's, it's yours. Just take it, have it all. And David says, nope. Nope, I am going to pay full price. I want to experience the sacrifice that it takes. This is going to be a legitimate business deal. I'm going to buy it from you, and I'm going to purchase this, because this is the place where I'm supposed to worship. And so David buys it. It's his free and clear. And then he worships on that site. And that's where he gives an offering to the Lord. If you look with me at the very end of the story, it's chapter 22, verse 1. David says this, this is the house of the Lord. We began worship today, singing, right? This is, this is the house of the Lord. We gather here to worship. Something important happens when God's people gather to, to sing his praises. In this moment, something important happens because David has sacrificed to the Lord, restoring, reconciling the relationship, and this is the altar of burnt offering for Israel. But here's what's really interesting if you pay close attention to your Bible reading. 2 Chronicles chapter 3 tells us that this threshing floor is not just any site. I want to put a picture of this on the screen for you. It's Mount Moriah. Do you remember Mount Moriah? Some of you do. Genesis chapter 22. Abraham is asked to sacrifice Isaac. He goes up here to sacrifice him. And of course, God, just like in this story, says, enough. And he provides a ram for the sacrifice and Isaac is spared. Now, centuries later, God leads David back to the exact same spot. Here's the second picture, a threshing floor. This is what they look like. It was a a flat piece covered by rock that they would use to beat out the, the little kernels of grain from the wheat so that they could make bread. This is the exact same place as Mount Moriah, just above the city of David. David says, now, this is to be the house of the Lord. What does he mean? He paid for it, and guess what's going to happen there? His son Solomon is going to build the temple there by which the sacrifices for sin would be made. Do you see it? Do you see how God doesn't overlook a single detail in the storyline of the Scripture? God provided a ram so that Isaac would be spared. God provided for David so that he could be reconciled to him by a sacrifice. God provides a place for the whole nation of Israel to come sacrifice day by day, year by year, so that their sins would be atoned for. But as I told you, David is not perfect. He is not the Messiah. His life points to the Messiah, but he he cannot save. He is not sinless. A man named Jesus of Nazareth would come to that same site. He would be betrayed there. He would be put on trial there. And just on the other side of that exact same spot, we call it Golgotha, he would be crucified once and for all. It's the same spot, brothers and sisters. God says this, this little corner of my world is where my judgment and my mercy will meet. It met at the cross. God had planned that location all along to be the place where his judgment, his righteous judgment against the sin of man would meet his compassion and mercy. And God said, I will take it on myself. I'll be the one who sacrificed so that you and you and you can live. I hope that makes your heart beat fast because it does mine. I hope I hope you understand that even in the chaos of David's life, God used what Satan, it said in verse 1, intended to destroy Israel. He superintended it for his plan and his purpose. We sang it earlier. God never stops working. 
even when we don't see it, even when we don't completely understand it. God is working in the chaos and the brokenness of our worlds and our lives in order to bring about his purpose and his glory. It's why today we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper. Because the cross is the place where just like in that same spot for David, his judgment and his mercy met. So I want you to make your seat an altar. The deacons are going to distribute our elements. I want you to prepare your hearts for this moment. And as you bow your head and close your eyes, I want you to think about David's experience with the Lord. That God used this to expose his sin and expose his pride. And in your heart and life, when we come to the table, we need our sin, our pride exposed as well. 1 Corinthians 11 warns us about coming to the table and not confessing. And so what is it today that you need to confess? Because your God is fully committed to showing you, here's where you've trusted in something other than me. Here is where you've broken my law. This is why you need a Savior. This is why you need my compassion and my mercy. So with your head bowed, your eyes closed, confess to him whatever you need to today. God takes sin seriously. This story proves that. The Bible proves that over and over again. We minimize it in our world today. We make little of it. God says, no, no, sin's a big deal. Such a big deal that I'm going to have to step in as the perfect sacrifice, the pure and spotless lamb. Because even David, as great as he was, could not, could not be the perfect sacrifice. After I pray in just a few moments, the deacons will distribute the elements. The instructions will be on the screen. If you belong to the Lord Jesus, then this moment belongs to you. If you don't yet, then use this time to prayerfully meditate on what we've talked about today. Hold on to those elements and I'll lead us in the taking of them corporately in just a few moments. But Lord Jesus, we thank you that even in these seemingly obscure stories in the Old Testament, every line is dripping with the gospel. Every phrase, every piece of the story points us to the severity of our sin, but the reality that your grace is greater. So God, may we sit in the wonder and the majesty that this is the place where your judgment and your mercy meet. As we take these elements now, it's in your name we pray. Amen. Deacons.